Before we begin, a bit of a disclaimer. The creator of Adventure Conqueror King System, or Axe, Alexander Macris, is a friend of mine who I've had on in past interviews and shows. Now, as always, that will not play a factor in this overview. With that said, on with the show. <laughs> Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. For this return to Mythos Miscellany, my series covering the non-core materials in RPGs, I'd like to call back to something I covered back in 2017, Adventurer Conqueror King System, or Axe, as I am not paid by the syllable. It's still one of my favorite retro clones, and some might argue it being a neo-clone due to changing too much from its source materials, but I think that's a case of getting lost in the weeds. That said, there was a lot of material that I skimmed over, given that my review style covers core books exclusively. Plus, at the time, I didn't quite know how to cover expansions on a book I had already reviewed. Now that I have somewhat of an idea with the previous uh, Mythos Miscellany, it's high time to rectify that. So consider this a kind of buyer's guide to Axe's official expansions. The only one I won't bring up here is the Player's Companion, because I brought that up in the initial review. Bear in mind that a lot of this is following up on my review of Axe itself, so I'd recommend looking at that video first and foremost. That aside, I'll be grading them based on how vital or optional each is to expanding the core experience. With the preambles aside, let's begin. This is a light entry at 23 pages, and I'd say our Empire Primer serves as the default setting of Axe and leans more into the Antiquity Era style that the core rules are aiming for. There's not a whole lot of crunch, so it's not all that necessary for Axe specifically, but it does provide a good skinny for GMs and players. Decent, but not a world builder. I'd give it a stamp of playable. Now we're getting into the heavier shit. Kanahu is a full-on setting expansion, delving into a style of fantasy that Axe core isn't, that being the pulpier end of sword and sorcery, with elements of weird fiction. Fans of Masters of the Universe or John Carter will find themselves relatively at home here. And because of its change in setting, the core rules have a few tweaks to cover. When rolling ability scores, you instead roll 4d6 and drop the lowest, or 5d6 and drop the lowest too. These are respectively referred to as the heroic and legendary options for character creation. Secondly, there's a rule on Pharaonic Tombs. If a deceased character is entombed properly, this grants the favor of Mawat, the god of the dead. That character's player can carry over 90% of the gold spent on the tomb as experience for their new character. Thirdly, a fate system is introduced, which starts at 1d6 and can be used to reroll in attack, proficiency, saving throw, damage, to cleave, which I'll get into later, or to cast a first level spell for free if you're a casting class. The primary way to regain fate points is spending time in a pinnacle of their alignment for one month, or by spending their level's monthly wage. There are, of course, other narrative means to recover these points. Fourth, Exploding Twenties and Critical Hits, the former of which works exactly as Exploding Dice usually do. Roll again and add the previous result. Critical Hits trigger on a hit of 10 or more over the target's armor class, and deal double damage like in other D20 games. In addition, the target must make a saving throw versus paralysis. If the save fails, they suffer a critical hit effect based on a D10 die roll. Additionally, Kanahu plays host to several classes, some specific to certain races. Of these are the following. The Blessed Undertaker, the Priest of Mawat, the God of Death, and specializes in slaying undead. Bugmen, a race of sentient insectoids, which are divided into the female spellcasting Ovate, the Bug Thieves and Merchants with the Dredger, and the Bug Fighters with the Praetors. Cultists, Lunatics who worship chaos, granted divine power by unknowable gods. Deep One Hybrids, the fishmen spawn of chaos that has some chaotic magic granted by Dagon and Rahab. Dragon Incarnate, humans born with the soul of a dragon who can tap into arcane magic at higher levels. Gecko Men, well, they're sentient gecko. These are separated into spirit talkers, a kind of divine caster that leans more into the shaman archetype, and stalkers who are akin to gecko rangers. <laughs> 
Lizard men operate exactly how they say on the tin and are separated into gladiators, a version of the Thracian gladiator, and hunters, a ambush-centric combatant, as well as priestesses, followers of Ex their god Exchala, and lastly warriors and witch doctors, the latter of which filling the tribal sorcerer archetype. Then you have Mog Brutes, a barbarian type of archetype that was created by the Visitors. Next is Necromancers, a priest of Pazuzu, the god of undead and sorcery. After that is the Nephil, the half-visitor tech users with some degree of telepathy. Then is the Terran Cosmonaut, essentially an astronaut from our world a la Buck Rogers. And finally, the Terran Starman, for those who want to go a little bit trekky with their um, axe play. Obviously, that's a lot of classes, most of which are there to accommodate the new races within the setting. In addition, it should be noted that most of the basic classes from Axe can fit in Kanahu, with the exception of the demi-human races in the core book, at least as is. Obviously, they could be recast, and the book gives several suggestions. Beyond that, the book has a gazetteer for several areas within Kanahu, in particular the Harat Coast and the free city of Harat, which provides a template to build upon. For those who want to lean into the tech smashed into a fantasy world a la Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, there's a whole category of visitor technology and how to utilize advanced tech by relative primitives. All in all, it's an impressive feat to put all this in just 150 pages, and with that, Kanahu gets a stamp of recommended. That said, I'd recommend getting your feet wet before diving into Kanahu, probably with a few core campaigns. It's a nice recognition to the more gonzo aspects of pulp fantasy. Contrary to popular belief, fantasy ain't just the Tolkien people. A sister game to Axe itself, Domains at War is a nod to D&D's wargaming roots by converting Axe into, well, a war game. This might sound odd, but it's a natural fit given the three-tier theme where you acquire followers and holdings at higher levels. This expansion is split into two books, Battles at 133 pages and Campaigns at 105 pages. That said, battles and domains are typically between armies made of several divisions, with the divisions made of three to eight units. These units tend to be around 120 infantry units or 60 cavalry units. Battles in this setup are hex-based, with turns divided into a series of phases. The initiative phase, where both commanders roll a 1d6 initiative roll, plus their strategic ability. The command phase, resolved based on the initiative of the respective commanders. In this phase, the commander activates the units in his army, limited by his number of activation points, or AP, that he has to spend. Activated units take a movement sequence and then an attack sequence. Movements can take the form of standing fast, marching, hustling, or a charge, which determines the movement rate and what attack sequences they have access to. Attack sequences work exactly like attack rolls in Axe Core, rolling to hit after calculating the target's armor class. When the commander has exhausted his AP, the opposition performs the same phase. And lastly, the morale phase, where both armies have to roll a 2d6 to determine if they continue fighting, if they become disordered, or if they attempt to retreat. There's a lot, and I mean a lot, of other factors, ranging from hero units, mass combat spells, magic item use, siege warfare, and upping the scale of battle to accommodate bigger units. However, I'd advise using this as a miniatures game, as it doesn't have the point system one would expect from a proper wargaming army. Beyond that, it's a nice addition, but its necessity is going to be dependent on how far you want to go into the Conqueror and King part of the Axe name. As such, I'd rate it as recommended, but if you get Guns of War as well, we'll talk about that later, I feel you'll get a lot more out of it than just Domains at War alone. Dwimmer Mount is a mega dungeon for Axe, but it's adaptable to other old school games, with a little work. Mega Dungeons, for those unaware, are exactly what they sound like on the tin. It's a dungeon on steroids, usually with a much, much larger map than a typical dungeon delve. In this case, Dwimmer Mount is 13 levels deep, located a few miles away from a town called Muntburg, which can serve as a hub for players. The first half of this 428 books consists of the starting knowledge of Dwimmer Mount on the player side, as well as a gazetteer on the city of Muntburg and the surrounding area around Dwimmer Mount itself. The second half covers the eponymous dungeon itself, the factions within it, and its many, many sections. In addition, there's a short list of new magic items, spells, and how to handle the idea of rival adventuring parties within the dungeon. Beyond that, there's not a whole lot to dissect. It's everything you'd expect from a mega dungeon. Personally, I'd rate it as recommended. It's good, 
but I wouldn't call it a required buy compared to other materials. Especially since the idea of doing Mega Dungeons might be a bit of a hard sell, depending on your table. Continuing on the previously mentioned theme of addressing the fantasy road less traveled, Guns of War is all about adding pike and shot to your fantasy gaming. This includes personal weapons, artillery, armies, formations, and how to magic up these guns a little. Were it not for the way Axe treats followers at higher levels, I'd argue that the parts about armies and formations would be unwarranted. But because it's assumed you'll have a sizable following in these second and third tiers of play, it naturally fits. How willing my recommendation is is going to depend on your player base. If they're leaning a little bit into the history buff material, this is a natural fit. However, for people who prefer beer and pretzels play, a little bit less so. Once again, I'd put this in as playable. However, don't mean that you should sleep on this. It's just that dealing with weapon tech might be a harder sell depending on the pitch and depending on the kind of fantasy your table wants to run. Heroic fantasy is something whose definition is... debatable. Hell, I have my own take that I'm sure someone would roast me over an open flame for. And it could be argued that heroic fantasy leans more into classical sword and sorcery, but once again, debatable. At the end of the day, this is a book of optional rules. So let's delve into the... 221 pages of them. Merciful Buddha, what did I do in a past life to deserve this? Okay, we'll start with chapter one, obviously. This being the introduction, which is primarily focused on answering what heroic fantasy is. Get used to Tolkien being brought up a lot in this section. Chapter 2 is all about heroes, and reintroduces the alternate ability score creation we saw in Kanahu. More importantly, the classes are tweaked to reflect the book's theme. There's a lot of new classes, and going in-depth with them would be a lengthy affair. The affordable classes present are... Berserker, Chosen, Ecclesiastic, Freebooter, Elven Spellsinger, Halfling Bounder, Halfling Burglar, Loremaster, Norbian Champion, Norbian Wizard, Occultist, Runemaker, Thracian Death Chanter, Venturer, War Mistress, and finally the Zaharan Dark Lord and Zaharan Sorcerer. Whew. That was a mouthful. Anyway, some of the classes presented have a series of subtypes that grant their own features, while others have features complete out of the box. Beyond that, there's advice about adapting the core classes into more Tolkien-esque campaigns. And after that is a list of new proficiencies, as well as ones that are modified to account for the mechanics introduced with this book. Chapter 3 is all about heroic deeds. This is a shorter chapter that focuses on the codes of honor and being a hero as a whole. Yes, I know. Talking about heroism in a book with heroic fantasy in the title. Real hard-hitting analysis there, huh? Anyway, this chapter introduces the idea of heroic fate and reintroduces fate points that we talked about briefly in Kanahu. As I mentioned before, fate points are a kind of extra effort system with several methods of allocations rather than just the one we saw in Kanahu. These allocations are meant to apply the heroic theme of the campaign and ultimately are the GM's call depending on how he wants to style that. It could be going for a grim and gritty or going for more mythic approaches. It's up to the GM. Regardless, a fate point can be used to do things like force a reroll, do a cleave effect regardless of whether or not you dropped an enemy, cast a first level spell for free, temporarily gain a proficiency, or recover health. Recovering fate points has multiple methods, be it spending time in solace, spending a month's wage, or none at all if the GM feels appropriate. Chapter 4 is titled Heroic Adventures, but primarily covers the expanded active mechanics. This includes Exploding Twenties, the critical hits roll we saw in Kanahu, new combat maneuvers like Clamber and Sweeps, and lastly, Thievery is modified to allow for bolder ones like in the Grey Mauser. Chapter 5 covers Heroic Magic. The primary additions presented here are Eldritch Magic, such as Spell Singing, Ceremonial magic, used by ecclesiastics, and more of the European priest kind of thing, as well as places of power, talismans, and how magic can be corrupted. There's also a nice touch with optional rules on dark magic, called the H.P. Lovecraft and R.E. Howard Memorial Rules. That said, ceremonial magic has several subtypes, each with their own thematic approaches and associated classes. These are the Antiquarian, i.e. Cunning Folk and Hoodoo Men, Chthonic, your Goetic Magicians, Liturgical, the Classical Magi, Runic, for Geomancers, Sylvan, for your fairy tale Wizard kind of approach, Shamanic, for Witch Doctors and Medicine Men, and Theurgical, for your Cabalists and Hermetic Wizards. 
The limiting factor of ceremonial magic is stigma, which is built up from failed ceremonies. This is a soft cap for how many times the wizard can, well, fuck up with their spellcasting. Of course, this ends with the Eldritch spell list, but no way am I covering all of those. There's way too many. Chapter 6 is Heroic Monsters, basically a new set of monsters to explore. Not a whole lot beyond that. Chapter 7 is Heroic Treasure, i.e. the loot. A lot of this is focused on magic items of various types, but there's also segments on alternative currency, which I like. The final chapter is Heroic Secrets, which is a reflection on using some of the new mechanics in this book to make custom classes as introduced in the player's companion. Now, in the initial review, I had said that the core book of Axe plays to its ultimate strengths with the addition of the player's companion. I'd say the same thing applies to the combination of Heroic Fantasy and Kanahu. The two of them seem to be a natural pair, given how the Oren Empire is the quote-unquote default for Axe core. Sort of. On its own, though, I'd still give it a stamp of recommended. If you want to lean more into the pulpy end of the paradigm, or if you want to be an actual Tolkien-esque RPG instead of D&D's attempt at Tolkien-esque, I'll get into that one of these days, or if you just want more options, period, this is an easy grab. In a rare case of color in these books, Secrets of the Nether City is a dungeon module that runs at 186 pages. Set in the Oren Empire setting, Nether City is a dungeon delve, although much smaller than Dwemer Mount. Ideally, it's designed for a party of six at fourth level, but it can accommodate smaller tables. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that it follows up on another adventure we'll cover, the Sinister Stone of Skara. That said, Nether City also introduces a few new spells, monsters, and a few new character classes. These four new classes are tied to the corrupted elves of Southern Argole. This race is represented by elven cultists, hierophants, warlords, and wizards. To be honest, Nether City can be summed up as a solid dungeon, but I'd be hesitant to recommend it if you're not running your campaign in the Oren Empire setting. You technically don't have to, but just slotting it into some other setting feels off. The addition of classes into a module also leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Final Grade is playable when all said and done, but... I'd hesitate to bring it to every table. Running at about 58 pages, Sepulchre of the Sorceress Queen is an adventure meant for levels 7 through 9. Unlike some of the other entries, this isn't a dungeon delve with multiple floors, though there is still a dungeon within it. It just happens to be relatively smaller. As such, there's not much to dissect, but it's a solid adventure that players can sink their teeth into, especially if they want to have a little bit more mid-range play. Thus, overall, it gets a rank of playable. Running at about 80 pages, this is the sole starter adventure in this series, and is recommended for levels 1 through 3. Unlike some of the other adventures, this one is far more newbie friendly. That comes with the territory for low recommended levels, but of all the adventures in this series, I could see Skara being used in demos to introduce people to this style of play. The dungeon is still present, and it's only two levels, so again adding to that whole starter adventure kind of thing. Because of that, I would give Sinister Stone of Skara a stamp of recommended. This might make for a good break em in adventure to give an idea of what Axe can do, even if they're already familiar with other D&D retro clones, since Axe does its own thing. So there we have it. The bulk of the Axe material that I have. This was a tricky thing to do because covering an adventure is difficult without delving into spoilers, which is why I didn't cover a whole lot of detail in the adventure entries. I realize that may sound a bit odd, but I don't like spoiling stories if I can help it. Also, all these particular entries are good, it's just a matter of what to throw money at first. Although if all of these are in something at, like at Bundle of Holding, yeah, grab that when you can. Personally, if you can only pick one of these, I would go with the Heroic Fantasy Handbook first, followed by Barbarian Conquerors of Kanahu. Those two have the largest volume of content that would get use. The other material can still get used, but it's more of what your table is going to prefer. This is the reason why I always say that I, I'm more of a tailor than a traditional reviewer. But that wraps up this particular dive into the expanded material for Adventure or Conqueror King's system, and I'd recommend grabbing a few of them if you want to mix up your old school fantasy. Yeah, I'm <laughs>